Welcome, everybody. As, um, as you heard, I'm Dr. Dargan. I'm glad you're here to uh, join with us. I think um, Kelly had just mentioned that uh, you can uh, chat in the uh, chat window if you have any questions, and Kelly will be monitoring that. Without further ado, I'll go ahead and get started. So we are here to talk about how to put together a, a very competitive um, application pro uh, package for speech-language pathology. It's one of the top um, uh, careers in uh, demand at the moment, and so it's very, the demand for, uh, supply and demand is not matching each other, and for that reason, it's very difficult to get into a speech-language pathology program. So I am here to help you make the best package that you possibly can. So to begin with, um, I want to talk about the essay. I think um, this is probably the scariest part for anyone who's starting to, um, to apply for any kind of uh, job or program. It's the essay. Why is that scary? It's because you can't just sit down and type a few sentences and be done. It's, it's something that has to be crafted. And I really feel like you have to live with your essay for a while, whether depending on what kind of writer you are, that might be a week, that might be a month, it might even be two months. The first thing I want to say about the essay, it should be your own work. We are very good at being able to decide if that is your writing or if you hired someone to do the writing. It actually goes against academic uh, integrity to have someone else write your essay for you, mainly because there are reasons why, what, why we're asking for an essay and what we're looking for how to first think about putting together an essay. You need to think about keeping everything clear and concise. Short sentences other than really, really long compound sentences. I think uh, when I first started as a, um, a graduate student, I wanted to, even in, in my doctoral studies, I wanted to sound smart. And so when I was thinking about my dissertation, I would get kind of writer's block just scared of what to write because I knew it had to sound smart. And when we think of sounding smart, we think of big words and complex sentences. But actually, the, the best type of writing is those that have shorter sentences rather than longer sentences and more common words than um, difficult uh, words that we may even have to look up in a dictionary. Also remember that you have taken the GRE, so we can match your GRE scores to the quality of an essay that you write. And we can kind of tell uh, if, that, um, if that matches or not. So that's another reason why you want to make sure that you're doing your own work. Of course, have people read it over, give you suggestions on editing, that sort of thing. But always be doing your own work. I read lots of essays, and I have to tell you, I am more interested in being able to pick up an essay and read through it quickly and get a, a really good glimpse of who you are and why you're applying. My personal pet peeve, and I think most of my colleagues would agree, is to read the first paragraph and there's this really smart, catchy first sentence or even first paragraph. I've read essays where um, chapters or books are quoted, and um, um, sayings from Einstein were quoted, and, and I would really encourage you not to go there. Um, keep it at a more scientific level, and keep it just plain, straightforward. I know that first sentence is always the most difficult, but just start it, and then go back and edit it. It'll be much better. Um, uh, if you have that uh, idea in mind. So when I'm reading an essay, what the purpose that we ask for an essay are for several things. One is we want to know why you want to be a speech-language pathologist. Two, why did you choose why you? Why Yeshiva University? What's special about us? Three, what are your career short-term and long-term plans? Can we actually be mentors to you? Is this a good fit for you? Or um, if you want, uh, you know, perhaps you want your master's in speech pathology to work towards um, a very unique goal. That would be something we'd 
would be very interested in reading. And probably the most important reason we ask for the essay is we want to get a sense of your writing style and your writing ability. So that in graduate speech language pathology, you are required to do a, a fair amount of writing, depending on what classes, but you'll be writing SOAP notes, you'll be writing evaluation reports, and good writing skills are important. So make sure you think more in a, in a science way of writing rather than perhaps a liberal arts writing. And what I mean by that is in the humanities, sometimes like creative art writing is not what we're looking for. We're looking for more scientific, straight to the point. Don't be flowery with your words and make sure that the that's and the witches and the wherefore art thou's are taken out of uh, the essay when appropriate. We're also looking at your GRE and GPA. So I'll say right now that we're a new program and any new program has to be competitive and look at the whole package of your application. And besides that, Yeshiva it prides herself into knowing that GREs, GPAs, and your writing alone doesn't dictate exactly what kind of student you will be. Oftentimes, we've accepted students with very low GPAs. Um, and they're some of the top performers in the class in graduate school. Um, it's very difficult to compare your GPA in an undergrad school um, at a small school versus maybe a, a, a research intensive school. Uh, one school to another doesn't necessarily equate GPA. So one person who has a 3.5 may be equivalent to someone who has a 3.9, etc. So it's only one part of the whole package. I did my doctorate at the University of Kansas, and I know there was an advisor there that would tell students that if you don't have a 3.99 GPA in your undergrad, don't even bother applying. It's a top program, and that was probably true in that, in that school. Um, but we look at more of a holistic approach. So 3.5 GPA is kind of a benchmark, which would be very competitive, I think with a school that looks at the whole package. I put some numbers up here, not to scare you, but the question is always, what kind of GRE score do you need? What kind of G GPA score do you need? So these are guidelines. Obviously, we've accepted students with far lower GPAs and far lower GREs, and of course, far higher GREs and GPAs. But in general, this would be a very competitive numbers package. So if you had a 3.5 GPA, a 150 verbal and quantitative on your GRE, and a 4.0 writing on your GRE, you'd be very, very competitive. Correspondence. So when you're putting together your package, you're going to be emailing to professors and to people in other departments and maybe admissions and, and such forth. And it's important to know your audience and to know who you're speaking to. So in correspondences, it's important to show your professionalism. So if you're sending me an email, you would probably say, dear Dr. Dargan, or Dr. Dargan, blah, 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 blah. Not, hey there, Troy. Um, I'm sure that's um, pretty self-evident, but uh, you would be surprised how many emails we get that um, do not have a um, professional type of salutation at the beginning and end. We are unique at Yeshiva because we extend an interview to every single applicant, whether you are um, um, definitely going to be accepted or if you're on the questionable mark. So here again, what do you need to do to prepare for the interview? I have to um, say that the best thing is to know your audience again. If you haven't done your research, that interview is going to be rough, and we're going to see it as probably that you're not as uh, committed to coming to YU as maybe we would like you to. And so what, does, what is it that I'm talking about? What, what am I looking for? So it would be very 
wise to go look up our background. Um, you can do that just simply at um, the YU page where our faculty profiles are listed and get a, a quick idea. So I'm a voice person and Professor Barrera is dysphagia person. So at least you have an idea of where we've come from and what we're going, uh, what we're going to be doing with research, et cetera, et cetera. But then also say what you mean. So what do I mean by that? Don't, don't tell us what you think we want to hear because we can tell that, that ingenuity, um, not being genuine reads very clearly in an interview. And that is probably the point where you would be a complete rejection, even if everything else was positive. So for instance, we've had people come to interview and they talk about how they want to study with me because uh, of my voice background. And so of course I ask them about voice and why they're interested in voice and try to probe a little further because I'm interested and it's clear that they don't even like voice let, and don't even know anything about it, let alone want to work with me on voice uh, stuff. So we just want you to be genuine. We want to know about you and we want you to come to the table very professional. Um, so do some research, know what we're about, know what YU is about, know what our program's about and be able to talk sincerely and uh, succinctly. So why, why you? I always like that catchphrase because it's why, why you? Get it? Yeah, that's, that's a very dorky professor joke and I say that um, I make more of those as I teach longer and longer. So um, our program is very unique and why is it unique? So it is unique in a few areas, and mainly it's because we have very intense medical classes. Our program is a medical focused program through our teaching of classes. I just listed a few classes there that are specific to our program. Of course, these courses are offered in other programs, but our program requires you to have them. And um, that is aphasia, neuromotor, craniofascia, and Dysphagia. Uh, we actually have two classes in dysphagia. We have pediatric dysphagia and geriatric dysphagia. And we require you to take both, and that's a total of five credit hours. So um, it's, it's, uh, it's a very unique program. It's a very unique uh, set of classes that I think will set you up for any kind of medical placement or your future in a um, medical establishment. But we're not just medical. So it's a speech language pro program. So if you're interested in child language, come on and come on over, apply, get accepted, study with us. Um, child language is uh, taught mainly by Professor Lastman here. And because it's a speech language program that is governed by um, ASHA, we have to offer all the courses that are required for you to be um, competent to be able to get a degree in a master's degree for speech language pathology. So you will be able to work in any setting. And it's my belief that studying medical helps even if you want to do child language, um, specifically pediatric dysphagia. It gives you a little idea of um, the medical side of things as well. I've listed here a website and um, it lists the programs. Um, I won't, I won't um, click on that now. Uh, I'll let you view that on your own so we can stay in the PowerPoint presentation. Our faculty is very unique too um, and I'm not just saying that. Uh, it, it's I, I thoroughly enjoy working with my colleagues and I think you would, you would enjoy being students of ours. I'm a voice person, but I'm far more than a voice person. I have interests in many things along with all of our other faculties. Like I said, Leah Lastman, she, um, soon to be Dr. Lastman, she uh, is finishing her PhD at Adelphi and her, um, area is child language, but her research interest is in um, pretty much 
to break it down, the crossover of audiology and speech language pathology. So she's got a very unique set of interests. She's worked in um, early intervention. She's been a, a clinic director at several schools for decades in the New York City area. Then we have um, uh, Ashley O'Rourke, who is our clinic director, who just came to us from the Department of Education. She had a very important job there, and she will be uh, heading our clinic. And uh, Professor Medved is finishing her clinical doctorate at Rocky Mountain University, and she works as a full-time SLP in a private clinic of our interim directors. Um, Professor and Dr. Uh, Marissa Barrera, who owns three clinics in the New York City area, and she's also created a, um, uh, a dysphagia um, uh, apparatus that helps clients uh, with a swallowing technique. So she has interest in business. She's owned businesses, and she's very entrepreneurial and a go-getter. She um, finished her doctorate at uh, CUNY City University of New York, and then there is me, Dr. Dargan, as you met. Uh, I am a voice expert. I have interests in business, obviously. I have a business uh, uh, providing continuing education through ASHA, um, and right now I, I, I mainly um, host Kitty Verdolini's voice courses. I'm in the process of hopefully creating my own courses um, when there's time. Uh, I also have interests in singing, and so I'm a professional singer. I've not been on Broadway yet, but maybe. And um, I also have interests in law and political science. So that's just a little bit about your faculty. It's not the typical faculty that has one degree and that's what they've done their whole life and they don't do clinic, they just do teaching. We do it all, we do teaching, we're all active in clinic to some extent um, and we have other interests so you can learn from us and you can, uh, um, we'd be happy to partner with you in research of, of any kind of area that you might be interested in. Um, the proper dress code would be um, well, I would dress as professional as you can, meaning guys, definitely um, casual business. So a shirt and khakis, preferably a tie, and most preferably a suit jacket. Women, um, skirt, suit pants, um, uh, something business casual or even a little higher than that. You can't overdress professionally for the interview. This is your time to shine. This is your time to show us that um, you really want to be here. So that's dressing up really does um, does tell us something about uh, about your character. Great, fantastic. So uh, we have a next question, and it uh, says, "Well, professor, great presentation. Um, I was wondering about the school's accreditation." Yes. So of course, this question was going to come. It comes all the time, and that's because we're a new program. So we are fully, um, when I say fully accredited, I, I'm probably not using the correct terminology, but basically uh, we are um, in the first stages of the accreditation process. So we, we passed all of the background to be able to um, admit students. At, and so you will come here, you will take classes, and you will graduate with a speech language uh, pathology uh, degree backed by ASHA. So within five years, we will then apply for regular status. We can't apply before three to five years because we have to be um, in existence for that long until we apply for regular status. But the name of the status doesn't mean it, it makes no difference. So first off, there's no reason to think that we wouldn't get full status. Second off, even if we didn't, worst case scenario, you would get a degree as if we did. So you coming here, um, we are we have all the bells and whistles that a fully accredited school does. We're not provisionally on um, probation or anything like that. It's just that we're new, starting out, and so we have that first five-year accreditation. 
Awesome, fantastic. So we have a, another question that asks, uh, does the program look for diversity? Absolutely. Um, I mean, we're in New York City, so uh, it would be impossible to get away from not looking for diversity. If we didn't want diversity, we would still get diversity, and we love it. So yes, we definitely um, love diversity. Uh, okay, great. Uh, continue, continuing on. This is great. We have so many questions. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so it says, if uh, we have lower GRE scores, do you think that's something we should address in the essay? Um, if, you know, for example, if someone's not a good test taker, um, should they talk about that in the essay or not mention it at all or wait for an inter the interview? That's a great question. Um, I would say it depends. So it depends how low the GRE are, is. Um, I think that we're going to see the GRE. So I can't. This is this is a question that's probably specific for different schools. I will say that for our school, it would probably be best to mention it uh, if there's a valid reason. So. Um, if you were undiagnosed with testing anxiety and you recently got diagnosed with testing anxiety, you can um, maybe write a short sentence of that and how you will work harder and in grad school and that sort of thing. So I would um, I would I would definitely not try to hide the fact because we're gonna see the numbers that we definitely look at the numbers the first thing. So um, I would definitely bring it up if you feel that there's a valid reason why that's shaded in some way. So uh, actually a great, a great example of this would be a student who came from a university, and that's all I'll say, I won't identify anybody farther than that, um, and that university was very unique in that they curbed all their grades. So their GPAs, were by default lower than any other school because everyone was curved, meaning that, you know, if, if the student wrote a 95% paper, but everybody else in her class write a, wrote a 99% paper, she might end up with a C. Um, so that would, that would be an excellent reason of why to mention it in an essay. Okay, fantastic. So uh, our next question is, uh, what is the acceptance rate? Um, the acceptance rate? I'm not sure I know exactly what the acceptance rate is. Um, I do know that our class sizes um, are some, the last two years that has been between 25 and 35 uh, students. Okay. Great. And uh, Gabrielle, who answered this question, I, I asked this question. I um, I work in the admissions office, and I can look this up, and I'll reach out to you and uh, get that information to you tomorrow or on Monday. Um, okay. Great. So looks, looks That'd be nice yeah. for me to know too. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. I'll I'll let you know. Thank you. Uh, okay. Looks like we have uh, just a couple more questions. So, uh, so in the essay, is it important to if there is a a considerable gap in time between finishing undergrad and now. Uh, so should that be addressed? Um, I mean, I, 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 I don't want to say you need to address it because we're going to see it because I don't know that I would spot that. Um, but I don't see how you would be unable to do that and write a good essay because the whole point of the essay is we want to know what you've been doing with your life. What are your life plans? We want to know what you've done and where you're coming and where you're going. So that that's actually would be a very powerful essay, in my opinion, to read what you've done in that gap. What, what has caused you to come back to school now? That would be a, a positive thing in our, and I'll say that I think everyone on faculty would view a non-traditional student very positively. Okay, great. Uh, and uh, our last question is, um, are letters of recommendation needed? And if so, um, are, do they need to be academic or um, can they be professional? Who uh, should they be from? So I believe we've reduced it down to two letters of recommendations. 
I do not believe there's a stipulation on that. Kelly, do you know exactly if they need to be academic? I don't believe either one has to be. I know that it. I know that we would like to have at least one be an academic recommendation. Uh, yes. Yeah, so from my understanding, it is. Um, yeah, two letters of recommendation. We don't require one academic and one professional, but uh, if uh, the preference is for one academic, however, if um, you know, so for example, if you have been at a school for a while and you're not in touch with your professors uh, from undergrad, then a professional, in that case, professional recommendations are fine. Uh, so the more important thing is to get a recommendation from people who know you well and can speak about uh, your readiness for the program and how successful you're going to be. Um, and so it's, uh, I am, um, I've been in admissions for a long time, so I've read a lot of recommendation letters and uh, along the lines of uh, what Dr. Dargan was talking about of kind of understanding and knowing um, during the interview whether how serious you are, that comes across very clearly in recommendation letters too if they're from people who don't know you well. So you want to really be thoughtful about who you ask um, to write those letters. I think that's a great point. Um, and also, we're not going to, I mean, we need a complete application. So if it means that you can't complete your application if you don't have an academic letter recommendation, just get, a le get two letters and have them sent in. Um, we're, not, we're not that stringent. Um, but... I would always ask people who, it's really difficult with students, you need to realize, you need to be able to tell who you have a good rapport with. And I would, I always ask, when I ask people to write me letters, I always ask, can you write me a positively strong letter of recommendation? Because anybody can write a letter, but will they write a positive one? If they're not going to write a positive one, then there's no need bothering with the letter, number one, because they're they're going to write something that makes you not even get into the program. And number two, uh, to Kelly's point, if if we're going to if it's short and a generic letter, and that does no good for us either. So if if you're approaching someone who really knows you well and will write a good letter but doesn't have time and doesn't put the effort into the letter, then it's better to get a quality letter um, over just checking the box and having someone academic. 